Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and welcome to episode 3 of my new series, Seismic Data, A Stake Through the Heart of Flat Earth. Having dealt with the preliminaries in the previous two episodes, we can now destroy Flat Earth entirely with a single seismic observation, Rally Waves. Rally Waves are a specific class of seismic wave that are generated when P waves and S waves travelling through a body are reflected from the surface of that body. These reflections cause quite complicated interactions. For instance, a P wave striking the surface of a body at an angle will have some of its energy reflected as a P wave and some as an S wave, as illustrated in this diagram. Similarly, an S wave that is incident on the surface of the body will have some of its energy reflected as a P wave and some as an S wave. For P waves and S waves generated close to the surface of the body, a series of both classes of waves will impact the surface, set up reflections, and these reflections will interact with one another. They will also interact with later arriving waves. There are a couple of mechanisms by which the interplay between incoming and reflected waves can generate self-perpetuating stress cycles within the surface layer of the body. For rally waves, this stress cycle involves compression near the surface of the body and extension inside the body, followed by extension at the surface of the body and compression within the body. This process is perhaps best illustrated rather than explained. Every time a material packet is deformed, the elastic restorative force counteracts that deformation and overcorrects, impacting the neighbouring material packet. Rally waves are a little bit slower than S waves, but they are the most destructive form of seismic wave, causing most of the material damage that results from earthquakes. Because of their mode of generation, they are trapped near the surface most layers of the body and remain reasonably coherent for long periods of time though their energy does decay exponentially with distance. It's not easy to come up with an everyday analogue for this type of wave, but they're kind of like an accordion, with the top compressing while the bottom expands, or the bottom compressing while the top expands. Or maybe I've just listened to too many Weird Al Yankovic albums. Who can tell? Now given how exotic Rayleigh waves seem, it's a worthwhile question for a sceptic to ask, how do you even know these things are real? Well, the fact is that we use sound all the time, and we understand the way sound waves travel through a medium very, very well. And we routinely apply this technical expertise to analyse the propagation and reflection of sound waves to reconstruct the geometry of objects we cannot see. This same methodology can be used to determine the internal structure of objects that are otherwise opaque. In its modern application, this technology is extremely useful in guaranteeing public safety across a broad variety of industrial and commercial applications. But where do rally waves come into all of this? Because they stay near the surface of objects, rally waves are extremely useful in detecting whether or not surface integrity has been maintained in metal objects. It has long been recognised that any disturbance in the propagation of rally waves across the surface of a metal object will reveal cracks or corrosion that might otherwise be undetectable. This photograph of ultrasound investigation of the integrity of a pipe was taken in the 1950s. And this technique is still in use today when investigating whether or not an operating aircraft is suffering wear or fatigue. A more determined sceptic might argue that, OK, metal objects in a workshop conditions is different from the Earth. How do we know that our understanding is still correct when applied to the Earth? Well, we test it. We take thumper trucks, like the one pictured here, out into the field and use them to generate seismic waves whose character we understand. We then examine how those waves reflect off subsurface structures, return to the surface and reflect from there. We then test the accuracy of our analysis by examining the structure of the subsurface directly through mining or drilling. And the verdict from all of these tests is that our understanding of the propagation and reflection of seismic signals is extremely good. OK, now that we've established that we observe Rayleigh waves and that we well understand what generates them, why are they so destructive to a flat Earth? Well, it comes back to how they propagate. Let's look at this animation I showed you previously for pressure waves. 
Just to remind everybody what's going on, we're assuming that the epicenter of the earthquake is at the top of the sphere, just for convenience. On the left is a top-down view from above the epicenter. On the right is a top-down view above the antipode to the epicenter. And once again, we see that the waves radiate outwards from the epicenter and then converge in the antipode. But they don't stop. They then return from the antipode to the epicenter, and they keep on going. Rally waves from sufficiently strong seismic events can circuit the Earth as many as three or four times. This behavior is completely inexplicable on a flat Earth model, where there is no known mechanism that can make a wave converge back onto its point of origin over multiple cycles. Having seen how rally waves behave in theory, we're now going to look at a practical seismogram. This is a seismogram from the Marble Bar Seismic Station of the 2004 Sumatra earthquake. To better illustrate what's going on for this seismic station, we're going to use this figure. On the left is a great circle cross-section for the great circle connecting the epicenter of the Sumatra earthquake and the marble bar receiver. On the right is a top-down view from above the epicenter, though this will alternate with a top-down view from above the antipode as the waves propagate. As the energy from the seismic event reaches the surface, it will generate Rayleigh waves, which will propagate in all directions. In this cross-section, we only see two waves, a blue wave that is traveling directly from the epicenter towards the receiver, and a red wave that is traveling in the opposite direction. And both waves start propagating along the surface of the planet. Almost immediately, the blue wave arrives at the receiver and is recorded there. It is labeled as R1. After that, nothing much happens at the receiver for a little while as the waves continue on their way each going in its own direction as they circle around the world. In time, they will converge on the antipode to the epicenter. Briefly, they will be reunited before they start their return journey back to the epicenter. And at this stage, it should have become blindingly obvious why this is such a big problem for flat earthers. The red wave is approaching the receiver from exactly the opposite direction that the blue wave approached it. And when it finally gets to the receiver, it will be registered as R2, denoted here by the red arrow. From here, it will keep on propagating and return to the epicenter of the event. Shortly after that happens, the blue wave will have returned to the receiver and be registered as R3, marked once again by a blue arrow. And then both waves will continue their journey, retracing the steps they made on their first circuit, once again passing into the antipodal hemisphere and converging on the antipode of the epicenter. There, they will meet once more before radiating outward from the antipode and starting their trajectory back towards the epicenter. As is almost always the case with cyclic phenomena, once you know the punchline, it starts to get more than a little repetitive. Once again, the red wave converges on the receiver from the opposite direction and is eventually registered as event R4, marked here by a red arrow. But by this stage, the waves have lost a lot of energy and are becoming indistinguishable from the background noise. So having put a lot of emphasis on the directions from which the rally waves are coming, how do we know that? Well, because it occurred to us that that might be something we're interested in, when we set up seismic stations, we usually put a lot of seismometers in there in an array formation so that we can work out the direction that the various waves are coming from. And because seismic risk assessment is important in seismically active areas with large population centers, many such regions have very dense seismic observation networks. And this can lead to dense networks covering very large areas, including, for example, the Swiss and Italian ALP systems. So we've got more than enough observation stations to identify rally waves when they happen and to work out where they're coming from and where they're going. Just to add insult to injury, Rayleigh waves aren't the only waves that exhibit this property. Atmospheric pressure waves generated by large volcanic explosions also radiate out from the focus, converge on the antipode, return back to the focus, and complete multiple circuits of Earth in the same fashion. And once again, as with seismic waves, we can easily determine the direction that these pressure waves are propagating from and propagating to. There are myriad YouTube videos and online data visualizations of weather station data recording the atmospheric pressure wave generated by the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hahapai volcanic event. Here's a visualization of the pressure wave at six hours after the eruption. 
And here's another visualization at 73 hours after the eruption, after the pressure wave has already completed several circuits of Earth. The comment section has blown up with people requesting I discuss this data without even the courtesy of a spoiler alert warning. Pricks. A similar phenomenon was observed after the Krakatoa eruption of 1883 and was the subject of an entire section of the Royal Society's report on the event. This was also heavily requested in the comments section because we live in the age of instant gratification and nobody has any patience anymore. Okay, well on that particularly grumpy note, I might call an end to proceedings. The key takeaway is that Rayleigh waves from large seismic events and atmospheric pressure waves from large volcanic events complete multiple circuits of the Earth, and the manner in which they do it completely precludes any flat Earth explanation. It doesn't matter what nonsense Nathan Oakley prattles about entropy, or what gibberish Bev spews about horizontal, or what rancid dog shit erupts from the sphincter quantum eraser calls a mouth. Rally waves and atmospheric pressure waves demonstrate that the Earth is spheroidal. It cannot be flat and be reconciled with these observations. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you'll join me next time when I'll discuss seismic wave reflections.